Iran in the crushes the United States and Iran have had an adversarial relationship ever since the 1979 revolution established the Islamic Republic. Given past U.S. interference in Iran most know to be the 1953 coup that restored Mohammad Reza Shah Pahlavi to power and the new regime's support for various radical groups. It is hardly surprising that the two states have remained suspicious of one another and only occasionally engaged in limited acts of cooperation. Iran is a more serious strategic challenge for the United States and Israel than is Syria. Both Damascus and Tehran support Hezbollah, Hamas, and Islamic Jihad, and both are enemies of Al-Qaeda. Each has chemical weapons and might have biological weapons, although the evidence for the latter is not conclusive. But there are three fundamental differences between Iran and Syria. First, Iran is seeking to master the full nuclear fuel cycle, which would allow it to build nuclear weapons if it so chose. It is also developing missiles that could deliver nuclear warheads against its neighbors, including Israel. This is why Israelis often refer to Iran as an existential threat. Iran will not be able to strike the American homeland with nuclear missiles anytime soon, but any weapons it might develop could be used against US forces stationed in the Middle East or against European countries. Second, some Iranian leaders and especially current President Mahmoud Ahmadinejad have made deeply disturbing remarks questioning both the occurrence of the Holocaust and Israel's right to exist. Although Ahmadinejad's call for Israel to vanish from the page of time, or to be erased from the pages of history, is often mistranslated as a call for Israel's physical destruction, that is, to wipe Israel off the map. It was still an out, just assertion that was bound to be profoundly troubling to Israelis, and many others, Iran's sponsorship of a conference on the Holocaust in December 2006, which featured prominent Holocaust deniers and other discredited extremists, merely reinforced global concerns about Iran's intentions. Third, Iran is the most powerful Islamic state in the Persian Gulf and has the potential to dominate that all-rich area. This is especially true in light of what has happened to Iraq since America invaded in March 2003. Iraq had been Iran's principal rival in the region, but it is now a divided and war-torn society and is in no position to check Iran. Iran has links to several of the dominant Shia factions in Iraq, giving it far more influence over Iraq's evolution than it possessed when Saddam Hussein ruled in Baghdad. This dramatic shift in the regional balance of power explains why some believe that Iran looks like the winner of the Iraq war. Of course, Iran's power advantage over its neighbors would be even more pronounced if it acquired a nuclear arsenal. Iran's growing power is not good for the United States which has long sought to prevent any one country from establishing hegemony in the Persian Gulf. This basic principle explains why the Reagan administration backed Saddam in the 1980s, when it looked like Iran might defeat Iraq in their bloody war. The United States also has strong incentives to prevent Iran from getting nuclear weapons. Israel is equally averse to seeing Iran dominate the Gulf, because a regional powerhouse of that sort could be a long-term strategic threat. The prospect of a nuclear Iran is even more worrisome for Israeli leaders, who tend to view it as the ultimate nightmare scenario. But Israel is not the only Middle East country that is now worried about Iran. Many of Iran's Arab neighbors are also concerned about its nuclear ambitions as well as its growing influence in the region. They fear that an especially powerful Iran might someday try to coerce them or even invade their country, as Saddam invaded Kuwait in August 1990. They are also somewhat suspicious of Iran because it is a Persian rather than an Arab state, and because they care about the balance of power within Islam between Shia and Sunnis. Iran is governed by deeply committed Shia, which alarms the leaders of Sunni-dominated states like Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, and the United Arab Emirates, who see Shia influence growing in the Arab world. For the first time, Shia govern Iraq, and Hezbollah, a Shia organization, has gained greater influence in Lebanon in the wake of its 2006 war with Israel. To make matters worse, Tehran has close ties with some Iraqi leaders and is a longtime supporter of Hezbollah, the United States, Israel, and Iran's Arab neighbors, including many of America's Gulf allies, have an independent interest in keeping Iran non-nuclear and preventing it from becoming a regional hegemon. Washington would be committed to keeping Iran in check even if Israel did not exist, so as to prevent the other Gulf states from being conquered or cowed by Tehran. Unqualified support from the Arab world would make it easier for the United States to preserve the balance of power in the Gulf, and obtain on that support requires an effective strategy. Over the past 15 years, Israel and the lobby have pushed the United States to pursue a strategically and wise policy toward Iran. In particular, they are the central forces today behind all the talk in the Bush administration and on Capitol Hill about using military force to destroy Iran's nuclear facial ITs. Unfortunately, such rhetoric makes it harder, not easier, to stop Iran from going nuclear. 
During the 1990s, Israel and its American supporters encouraged the Clinton administration to pursue a confrontational policy toward Iran, even though Iran was interested in improving relations between the two countries. That same pattern was at play again in the early years of the Bush administration, as well as in December 2006, when Israel and the lobby made a concerted effort to undermine the Iraq study group's recom. Mendation that President Bush negotiate with Iran. Were it not for the lobby, the United States would almost certainly have a different and more effective Iran policy. U.S. efforts to deal with Iran are further undermined by Israel's reaper scythe policies in the occupied territories, which make it harder for the United States to gain the cooperation of Arab countries. Indeed, one of the main reasons that Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice finally began pushing forward the Arab. Israeli peace process in late 2006 was Saudi Arabia's insistence that it could not fashion an effective Iran policy with Washington as long as there was so much anger toward the United States in the Arab world over the Palestinian issue. As discussed in Chapter 7, Rice's efforts are likely to fail, because Israel's current leaders do not want to create a viable Palestinian state and the lobby will make it very difficult for President Bush or any other president to get Israel to change its approach to this issue. In short, thanks in good part to Israel and its American backers, the United States has pursued a counterproductive policy toward Iran since the early 1990s and is having difficulty getting support from states that have their own reasons to help Washington deal with Iran and would otherwise be inclined to do so. Confrontation or conciliation The United States had excellent relations with Iran from 1953 until 1979, when the American Bakshar was toppled and Ayatollah Khomeini and his Islamic theocracy came to power. Since then, relations between the two countries have been almost entirely adversarial. Israel has also had hostile relations with Tehran since the Shah's overthrow. During the 1980s, however, neither the United States nor Israel were seriously threatened by Iran, mainly because it was involved in a lengthy war with Iraq, which pinned it down and sapped its strength. To preserve the regional balance of power, the United States simply had to make sure that the war ended in a stalemate. It accomplished this objective by helping Saddam Hussein's forces stymie Iran's army on the battlefield. Iran was exhausted when the war ended in 1988, and it was in no position to cause trouble in the region for at least a few years. Furthermore, Iran's nuclear program was put on the back burner during the 1980s, possibly because of the war. Israel's perception of the Iranian threat underwent a fundamental change in the early 1990s, as evidence of Tehran's nuclear ambitions began to accumulate. Israeli leaders began warning Washington in 1993 that Iran was a grave threat not only to Israel, but to the United States, as well. There has been no let-up in that alarmist and aggressive rhetoric since then, largely because Iran has continued to move ahead on the nuclear front. Today, many experts believe the Iranians will eventually build nuclear weapons unless something is done to topple the clerical regime, alter its ambitions, or deny it the capacity. The lobby has followed Israel's lead and echoed its warnings about the dangers of allowing Iran to become a nuclear power. Israel and the lobby are also troubled by Iran's support for Hezbollah, by its endorsement of the Palestinian cause, and by its refusal to accept Israel's right to exist. Needless to say, statements like President Ahmadinejad's reinforce these concerns. Israel and its supporters tend to see Iran's policies as a reflection of deep ideological antipathy to the Jewish state but they are more accurately seen as tactical measures intended to improve Iran's overall position in the region. In particular, endorsing the Palestinian cause and helping groups like Hezbollah win sympathy in the Arab world and helps discourage an Arab alliance against Persian Iran. As the Iran expert Tritipasi convincingly shows, Iran's commitment to Hezbollah and to the Palestinians has varied considerably over time, usually in response to the overall threat environment. Relations between the clerical regime in Iran and the largely secular PLO were not warm during the 1980s, and Iran began backing hard. Line Palestinian groups like Islamic Jihad only after its exclusion from the 1991 Madrid Conference and the onset of the Oslo peace process. These events led Tehran to resist what it correctly saw as a broad U.S. effort to isolate it and deny it a significant regional role, and it did so by backing extreme ICE groups that also opposed Oslo. As Martin Indyk, who played a key role in formulating U.S. policy at the time, later recalled, Iran had an incentive to do us in on the peace process in order to defeat our policy of containment and isolation. And therefore, they took aim at the peace process. There are two broad alternatives for dealing with Iran's nuclear program and its regional ambitions. One approach, which is favored by the Israeli government and its key American supporters, proceeds from the belief that Iran cannot be contained once it acquires nuclear weapons. This view assumes that Tehran is likely to use its nuclear weapons against Israel, because Iranian leaders, 
with their apocalyptic vision of history, would not fear Israeli retaliation they might give nuclear weapons to terrorists or use them against the United States themselves, even if doing so invited automatic and massive retaliation. Therefore, Iran cannot be allowed to acquire a nuclear arsenal. Israel would like Washington to solve this problem, but Israeli leaders do not rule out the possibility that the Israel Defense Forces might try to do the job if the Americans get cold feet. This approach also assumes that conciliatory diplomacy and positive incentives will not convince Iran to abandon its nuclear program. In concrete terms, this means that the United States has to impose sanctions on Iran and maybe even conduct a preventive war if it continues down the nuclear road. To facilitate putting serious pressure on Iran, Israelis and the lobby want the United States to maintain a substantial American military presence in the Middle East, in contrast to America's pre-1990 strategy of acting as an off sure balancer and keeping its military forces over the horizon. For the past 15 years, this confrontational formula for dealing with Iran's nuclear program has vied with a second strategy, one more consistent with the American national interest. This alternative approach asserts that while it would be better for the United States if Iran did not acquire nuclear weapons, there is good reason to think a nuclear Iran could be contained and deterred. Just as the Soviet Union was contained during the Cold War, it also argues that the best way to stop Iran from building nuclear weapons is to engage it diplomatically and attempt to normalize its relationship with the United States. This strategy requires taking the threat of preventive war off the table, because threatening Iran with regime change simply gives its and leaders even more reason to want a nuclear deterrent of their own. The Iranians, like the Americans and the Israelis, recognize that nuclear weapons are the best protection available for a state that is on another state's hit list. As the Iran expert Ray Taki of the Council on Foreign Relations has written, Iran's nuclear calculations are not derived from an irrational ideology, but rather from a judicious attempt to craft a viable deterrent capability against an evolving range of threats. Iran's leadership clearly sees itself as being in Washington's crosshairs, and it is precisely this perception that is driving its accelerated nuclear program. Registered sign the case for engagement is buttressed by the fact that preventive war looks like a very unattractive alternative. Even if the United States could eliminate Iran's nuclear facilities, Tehran would almost certainly rebuild them, and this time the Iranians would go to even greater lengths to disperse, hide, and harden them against an attack. Also, if Washington launched a preventive strike against Iran, Tehran would be bound to retaliate wherever and whenever it could including going after oil shipments in the Persian Gulf and using its considerable influence to make matters worse for the United States in Iraq. Additionally, Iran would be likely to establish closer ties with China and Russia, which is not in America's interest. By contrast, if the United States were to remove the threat of war and engage Iran, then Tehran would be more inclined to help Washington deal with Al-Qaeda, tamp down the war inside Iraq, and stabilize Afghanistan. It would also be less likely to align with China and Russia, Dead given the history of poisonous relations between America and Iran, there is no guarantee that engagement would produce a grand bargain that would halt Iran's nuclear program. After all, there is little chance that Israel will give up its own nuclear weapons, and Iranian leaders might believe that if Israel has a nuclear deterrent, then so must Iran. Nonetheless, this approach is more likely to work than threatening preventive war, and if it does fail, the United States can always fall back on deterrence. One might have expected the United States to have adopted some various shine on the engagement strategy by this time, especially given that a decade and a half of confrontation has not borne fruit. Engagement enjoys substantial support in the CIA, the State Department, and even the US military, which has shown little enthusiasm for bombing Iran's nuclear facilities. London Sunday Times reported in late February 2007 that some of Amir Iker's most senior military commanders are prepared to resign if the White House orders a military strike against Iran, according to highly placed defense and intelligence sources. In fact, Iran has repeatedly signaled an in terrorist in engagement. Its leaders have reached out to the United States on a number of occasions over the past 15 years, hoping to improve relations between the two countries. Remarkably, Iran has even offered to put its nuclear program up for negotiation and offered to work out a modus vivendi with Israel. Yet despite these promising opportunities, Israel and the lobby have worked over time to prevent both the Clinton and Bush administrations from engaging Iran, and they have prevailed at almost every turn. Unfortunately, but predictably, this hardline approach has not worked as advertised and has left the United States worse off than if it had pursued a strategy of engagement. In response to this failed strategy, there is a growing chorus of voices inside and outside of Washington calling for a new opening toward Iran. Equally unsurprising, 
Israel and the lobby are fighting to prevent the United States from reversing course and seeking a rapprochement with Tehran. They continue to promote an increasingly confrontational and counterproductive policy instead. The Clinton administration and dual containment in early 1993, just as the Clinton administration was coming to power, Israeli Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin and his foreign minister, Shimon Peres, started claiming that Iran was a growing threat to both Israel and the United States. Israeli leaders portrayed Iran as a dangerous adversary in part because they saw it as a way of fostering closer relations between Jerusalem and Washington now that the Soviet threat had disappeared. The hope was that the United States would see Israel as a bulwark against Iranian expan Zionism, much the way Israel had been treated as a bulwark against Soviet influence in the Middle East. Israel was also justifiably concerned about Iran's renewed interest in developing a sophisticated nuclear program to the Washington Post reported in mid-March 1993 that across the Israeli political spectrum, there is a conviction that American public opinion and political leaders need to be further convinced of the urgency of restraining Iran, and that the United States is the only global power capable of doing so. The Clinton administration responded to Israel's entreaties by adopting the policy of dual containment, as we have discussed. Not only was the Paul I.C. first enunciated at the Washington Institute for Near East Policy by Martin Indyk, but Robert Pelletro, the Assistant Secretary of State for Near Eastern Affairs at the time, told Tritipasi that the policy was essentially a copy of an, an Israeli proposal. Kenneth Pollock of Brookings's Sabin Genter also notes that Jerusalem was one of the few places on earth where dual containment was not regularly misunderstood. The new policy called for the United states to abandon its traditional strategy of acting as an offshore balancer in the Persian Gulf and instead station a substantial number of troops in Kuwait and Saudi Arabia for the purpose of containing both Iran and Iraq. In fact, the policy was designed to do more than just contain Iran. It also aimed to cause dramatic changes in Iran's behavior, among its goals, was forcing Iran to stop supporting terrorists and to abandon its nuclear program, Israel's concerns notwithstanding. There was no good reason for the United States to adopt a hard-line policy toward Iran in the early 1990s. If anything, just the opposite was the case. Akbar Hashemi Rafsanjani, who became Iran's president in 1989, was committed to improving relations with Washington and Iran, which had recently suffered through a devastating war with Iraq, was hardly a military threat to the United States. In the early 1990s, in fact, American leaders were much more concerned about Saddam Hussein against whom the United States had just fought a war plus, Iran's nuclear program had barely gotten off the ground in 1993. Few voices in Washington were calling for tougher policies against Iran before Israel began clamoring for a more confrontational policy, and dual containment was widely criticized when it was first announced by the mid-1990s. There was growing dissatisfaction with dual containment, because it forced the United States to maintain hostile relations with two countries that disliked each other intensely and it left Washington pretty much alone to handle the demanding task of keeping them in line. Consequently, pressure began to build in the United States to think about engaging Iran rather than confronting it. At the same time, however, Rabin was under pressure in Israel to get the Clinton administration to toughen up the policy. Rabin's critics felt that dual containment had no real teeth be, cause it had done little to stop the substantial economic intercourse between Iran and the United States. Israel and the lobby, especially the American Israel Public Affairs Committee, mobilized to save dual containment and to close the loopholes that allowed American companies to trade and invest in Iran. In mid-1994, Parsi reports, at the behest of the Israeli government, AIPAC drafted and circulated a 74-page paper in Washington arguing that Iran was not only a threat to Israel, but also to the United States and the West. According to Pollock, the right, AIPAC, the Israelis were all screaming for new sanctions on Iran. The Clinton administration was willing to go along, largely because it was focusing on the Oslo peace process and wanted to make sure that Israel felt secure and that Iran, a potential spoiler, did not derail the process. AIPAC laid out its basic game plan in April 1995, when it issued a report titled Comprehensive U.S. Sanctions Against Iran, a plan for action. By that point, however, steps were already being taken to tighten the economic noose around Iran's neck. Senator Alphonse D'Amato, RNY, with Accord Eyeing to Pollock, some help from the Israelis introduced legislation in Yan. Uri 1995 to end all economic links between the United States and Iran, the Clinton administration opposed the legislation at first and it stalled in Congress. But two months later, groups in the lobby achieved their first success after Iran chose Conoco, an American oil company, to develop the Siri oil fields. Degiran deliberately selected Conoco over several other foreign bidders in order to signal its interest in improving relations with the United States. But this friendly overture went nowhere, 
because Clinton killed the deal on the 14th of March. One day later, he issued an executive order banning American companies from helping Iran develop its oil fields. Clinton later said that one of the most effective opponents of the Conoco deal was Edgar Bronfman Sr., the powerful former head of the World Jewish Congress. APAC also played a key role in scuttling that deal on the 6th of May. The president issued a second executive order banning all trade and financial investments with Iran, which he labeled an unusual and extraordinary threat to the national security, foreign policy, and economy of the United States. Clinton had actually announced that he was going to take that step one week earlier in a speech to the World Jewish Congress. His decision to nix the Conoco deal and issue those two executive orders was, notes Pollock, a major demonstration of our support for Israel, Iron Ikeli, although Israel lay behind the American decision to cut economic ties to Iran. Israel did not pass any laws barring Israeli-Iranian trade and Israelis continued to purchase Iranian goods through third parties. But those executive orders were not enough for the lobby, because executive orders could be quickly reversed if Clinton ever changed his mind. A.M. Rosenthal, a strong defender of Israel, made this point in a New York Times column in which he criticized the Conoco deal. The only problem, with executive orders is that what the president giveth he can cancel eth. In response to this potential problem, Trita Parsi reports that on its own initiative, APAC revised the bill that Senator D'Amato had introduced in January 1995 and convinced the New York senator to reintroduce it in 1996 with IPAC's proposed changes. The new bill, which eventually came the Iran-Libya Sanctions Act, imposed sanctions on any foreign companies investing more than $40 million to develop petroleum resources in Iran or Libya. Although the proposed legislation infuriated America's e European allies, the House passed it by a vote of 415-0 on the 19th of June 1996, and the Senate passed it by unanimous consent one month later. Clinton signed the bill on the 5th of August, even though there was significant opposition to the new legislation throughout the administration. Indeed, Kenneth Pollack writes that much of the executive branch hated the D'Amato bill. In fact, for many, hated was too mild a word, however, Many of President Clinton's domestic policy advisers thought it would be sheer stupidity for the White House not to endorse the bill, since Clinton was up for re-election in three months. They were probably right. As Ziv Schiff, the military correspondent for Haaretz, noted at the time, Israel is but a tiny element in the big scheme, but one should not conclude that it cannot influence those within the Beltway. Similarly, James Glessinger, who has held a number of cabinet-level positions in different administrations, remarked in the wake of these sanctions, it is scarcely pose. Seibel to overstate the influence of Israel supporters on our policies in the Middle East. The Conoco episode casts further doubt on the oft-repeated claim that the oil lobby is the real hidden hand behind U.S. Middle East policy. In this case, an American oil company wanted to deal with Iran, and Iran wanted to do business with it. The oil industry was opposed to overturning the Conoco deal, and it also opposed the legislation to impose sanctions on Iran. Three inches is noted in Chapter 4, Dick Cheney, a prominent advocate of confronting Iran today publicly opposed the U.S. sanctions program when he was president of the oil services company Halliburton in the 1990s. But oil interests were steamrolled by APAC on every decision. These outcomes provide more evidence of how little influence the oil companies have on U.S. Middle East policy when compared with Israel and the lobby. The American posture continued to harden even as new opportunities for engagement became apparent. On 23 May 1997, Mohammed Khatami was elected president of Iran. He was even more enthusiastic than his predecessors saw about improving relations with the West and the United States in particular. He made conciliatory remarks in his inaugural speech on the 4th of August and in his first press conference on the 14th of December. Most important, he went out of his way in a lengthy CNN interview on the 7th of January 1998 to express his respect for the great American people and their great civilization. He also made it clear that Iran did not aim to destroy or undermine the American government, and that he regretted the infamous takeover of the U.S. Embassy in 1979. Recognizing the existing hostility between Tehran and Washington, he called for a crack in this wall of mistrust to prepare for a change and create an opportunity to study a new situation. Furthermore, Katami did not rule out the possibility of an Israeli state in historic Palestine and declared that terrorism should be condemned in all its forms and manifestations. He also denounced terrorism against Israelis. While noting that supporting peoples who fight for the liberation of their land is not, in my opinion, supporting terrorism, this caveat notwithstanding, Katami's remarks were still a marked shift in Iran's position, and other Iranian spokesmen soon echoed Iran's willingness to accept Israel if it reached an agreement with the Palestinians. In the wake of Katami's conciliatory comments, 
the Clinton administrator Cheyenne, after checking with Israel and key figures in Congress, made a num. There of small gestures to improve relations between Iran and the United States, Clinton and Secretary of State Madeleine Albright made contrite remarks about past Western conduct and the United States' ease visa re restrictions on travel between the two countries. Even Martin Indyk, the architect of dual containment, who was then serving as U.S. ambassador to Israel, told reporters that the United States has made it clear repeatedly that we have nothing against an Islamic government in Iran. We are ready for a dialogue. But the commercial restrictions remained in force and dual containment continued for the rest of Clinton's second term. This failure to alter course was partly due to hardliners inside Iran, who were strongly opposed to Qatami's plans to engage with the great Satan, for. But Israel and its supporters in the United States also played an important role in discouraging an American-Iranian rapprochement. For starters, the lobby had been largely responsible for developing and sustaining dual containment in the years before Qatami came to power in 1997. That policy, of course, helped poison relations between Tehran and Washington, which, in turn, increased the political power of the Iranian politicians who opposed Iran's new and more moderate leader. Furthermore, as soon as it became clear in mid-December 1997 that Qatami was calling for better relations with America, Israeli officials moved to thwart his initiative. Haaretz reported that Israel has expressed its concern to Washington at reports of an impending change of policy by the United States towards Iran. Adding that Prime Minister Netanyahu has asked APAC to act vigorously in Congress to prevent such a policy shift, APAC did as Netanyahu asked. According to Gary Sick, one of AMA, because leading experts on Iran, the gradual improvement of U.S. Iran rela shines after the election of Qatami was not reflected in APAC's positions. In fact, by early 1999 only APAD, the Iranian monarchists in exile and the terrorist Mujahideen, Ikalt persisted in their relentless insistence that little or nothing had changed in Iran, even after the Israeli ambassador to the United States had said in the spring of 2000 that it would be acceptable for Clinton to allow certain food and medical supplies to be exported to Iran, APAC still campaigned against the legislation. APAC did not oppose Klein Tun's decision to lift the ban on caviar Persian rugs and pistachios imported from Iran, but the Anti-Defamation League and the Conference of Prezi Dents of major American Jewish organizations did, Clinton ultimately got his way in both cases, mainly because each involved small amounts of trade and little controversy. But the United States did not make a serious effort to grasp the hand that Qatami had tentatively extended. It made good sense for the United States to engage Iran during the 1990s and attempt to improve relations between the two countries. Dual containment, as Brent Scowcroft observed, was a nutty idea. Israeli leaders, however, believed that it was in Israel's interest to prevent President Clinton from pursuing engagement, even if that more aggressive policy was not in America's national interest. Ephraim Sneer, one of Israel's lead Einhawks on Iran, put the point succinctly, we were against it, United States-Iran dialogue, because the interest of the US did not coincide with ours, the lobby followed Israel's lead. The Bush administration and regime changes discussed in Chapter 8, the attacks on the 11th of September, 2001, led President Bush to abandon dual containment and pursue the even more ambitious strategy of regional transformation. The American military would now be used to topple hostile regimes across the Middle East. From Israel's perspective, Iran was ideally suited to be the first target on the Bush administration's hit list. Since the early 1990s, Israeli leaders have tended to portray Iran as their most dangerous enemy, because it is the adversary most likely to acquire nuclear weapons. As Israeli Defense Minister Benjamin Ben Eliezer remarked one year before the Iraq war, Iraq is a problem. But you should understand, if you ask me, today Iran is more dangerous than Iraq. Nevertheless, Sharon and his lieutenants recognized by early 2000 and two that the United States was determined to confront Iraq first and deal with Iran after Saddam had been removed from power. They raised no serious objections to this ordering of the agenda although they kept reminding the Bush administration that it had to deal with Iran as soon as it finished the job in Baghdad. Sharon began publicly pushing the United States to confront Iran in November 2002, in an interview with the Times of London. Describing Iran as the center of world terror and bent on acquiring nuclear weapons, he declared that the Bush administration should put the strong arm on Iran the day after it conquered Iraq. In late April 2003, after the fall of Baghdad, Haaretz reported that the Israeli ambassador in Washington was now calling for regime change in Iran. The overthrow of Saddam, he noted, was not enough, in his words, a Marika has to follow through. We still have great threats of that magnitude coming from Syria, coming from Iran, ten days later.
The New York Times reported that Washington was growing increasingly concerned about Iran's nuclear ambitions and that there is a lot of hammering from the Israelis for us to take this problem seriously. Shimon Peres then published an op-ed in the Wall Street Journal on the 25th of June titled We Must Unite to Prevent an Ayatollah Nuke. His description of the Iranian threat sounded just like his earlier description of the threat from Saddam, even including a ritual reference to the lessons of appeasement in the 1930s. Iran, he emphasized, must be told in no uncertain terms that the United States and Israel will not tolerate it going nuclear. The neoconservatives also lost no time in making the case for regime change in Tehran. In late May 2003, Interpress Service reported that the neocons' efforts to now focus U.S. attention on regime change in Iran have become much more intense since early May and have already borne substantial fruit. Deg. In early June, according to the forward, neoconservatives inside and outside the administration have been urging an active effort to promote regime change in Tehran. Reports of possible covered actions have surfaced in recent weeks. As usual, there was a bevy of articles by prominent neoconservatives essentially the same people who had helped push the war in Iraq making the case for going after Iran. William Crystal wrote in the Weekly Standard on the 12th of May that the liberation of Iraq was the first great battle for the future of the Middle East. But the next great battle not, we hope, a military battle will be for Iran. Michael Ledeen, one of the leading hawks on Iran, wrote in the National Review Online on the 4th of April, there is no more time for diplomatic solutions we will have to deal with the terror masters, here and now. Iran, at least, offers us the possibility of a memorable victory b, cause the Iranian people openly loathe the regime, and will enthusiastically combat it. If only the United States supports them in the just struggle, other pundits offering similar views at this time include Daniel Pipes of the Middle East Forum and Winnips Patrick Clawson, who published a piece in the Jerusalem Post on the 20th of May titled Turn Up the Pressure on Iran. They called for the Bush administration to support the Mujahideen Kalb, a group based in Iraq that is bent on overthrowing the regime in Tehran, but that the US government has designated a terrorist organization. Lawrence Kaplan argued in the New Republic on the 9th of June that the United States needed to get tougher with Iran over its nuclear programs, which he feared were further along than most American policymakers recognized. On the 6th of May, the American Enterprise Institute co-sponsored an all-day conference on the future of Iran with two other pro-Israel organizations, the Foundation for the Defense of Democracies and the Hudson Institute, and the speakers were all strong supporters of Israel like Bernard Lewis, Senator Sam Brownback. Yuri Labrini, senior advisor to the IDF and former is really government coordinator for Southern Lebanon, Maris Amate from the Jewish Institute for National Security Affairs, and former executive director of APAC, Michael Ledeen, Ruel Mark Jerich from the AEI, and Mirav Wormser from the Hudson Institute. The main question on the table was the obvious one, what steps can the United States take to promote democratization and regime change in Iran? The answer was predictable. Each of the speakers called for the United States to do much more to bring down the Islamic Republic and replace it with a democratic state. Toward this end, the lobby has struck up a close relationship with Reza Pahlavi, the son of the late Shah of Iran. He is believed to have had personal meetings with both Sharon and Netanyahu, and he has extensive contacts with pro-Israel groups and individuals in the United States. The evolving relationship is much like the one that influential groups in the lobby had previously cultivated with Iraqi exile Ahmed Chalabi. Seemingly unaware that Pahlavi, like Chalabi, has little legitimacy in his homeland, pro-Israel groups have promoted his cause. In return, he makes it clear that if he were to come to power in Iran, he would make sure that his country has friendly relations with Israel. On the 19th of May, 2003, Senator Sam Brownback announced that he planned to introduce legislation to fund opposition groups and promote democracy in Iran. The so-called Iran Democracy Act was backed not only by Iranian exiles, but also by APAC, Jinsa, and the Coalition for Democracy in Iran, whose founders included Maurice Amate of Jinsa and Michael Ledin of AEI. The bill was introduced in the House by Brad Sherman, DCA, and other dedicated supporter of Israel, and by late July it had been passed by both houses of Congress, although the C was removed from the final legislation. The groups backing this legislation have emphasized that Iran is a major menace because it supports terrorism and is close to becoming a nuclear power. But they also have tried to blame Iran for some of the other problems that the United States has faced since the fall of Baghdad. Neoconservatives in the Pentagon suggested that Iran was harboring some of the Al-Qaeda operatives who had attacked US and other targets in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia, on the 12th of May, 2003. The Iranians denied this charge 
and both the CIA and the State Department viewed the neoconservatives' accusations with considerable skepticism. The neoconservatives have also been among the most forceful proponents of the claim that Iran has been supporting attacks against American troops in Iraq. As Michael Ledeen wrote in April 2004, Iraq cannot be peaceful and secure so long as Tehran sends its terrorist cadres across the border of Iran is contributing to militias in Iraq. It hardly proves that US and Iranian interests are irreconcilable. Iran is not the main source of America's problems in Iraq, and the United States would be in deep trouble there even if Iran were doing nothing. Nor would it be surprising if Iran were acting in this way. After all, the world's most powerful country has invaded two of Iran's neighbors, while simultaneously declaring that Tehran is part of the axis of evil. The US Congress has passed a law calling for regime change in Iran. And the Bush administration has funded Iranian exile groups and hinted on several occasions that it might strike Iran with military force. Wouldn't any country facing this sort of threat do whatever it could to protect itself, including using its influence with different Iraqi factions and possibly sending them various forms of aid? If a hostile power conquered Canada or Mexico and tried to set up a sympathetic government there, wouldn't the United States try to complicate that hostile power's efforts and ensure an outcome more favorable to U.S. interests? Americans have good reason to resent Iran's influence in Iraq, but they should hardly be surprised by it or see it as evidence of unremitting Iranian hostility. It is also worth noting that deep antipathy did not prevent the U.S. government from engaging Soviet leaders throughout the Cold War even when Moscow was providing millions of dollars worth of military aid to North Vietnam, which used this assistance to kill thousands of American soldiers.